If Pete Seeger was the Pied Piper of the folk revival, Peter, Paul, and Mary were its town criers. They didn't start the revival, but their arrival made it something else, at once more popular and political, commercial and radical, traditional and revolutionary. Success like theirs was considered impossible until they succeeded. They put protest songs on the hit parade, social activism in the same breath with superstardom. Senator Eugene McCarthy described them as artists who led the country by inspiring the conscience of Americans. I remember like it was yesterday, said actor Ossie Davis, how they held us in the palm of their hands. The struggle set to music, that's how I hear them still. And feminist icon Gloria Steinem wrote, they have a unique understanding that there's no revolution without music and also no music without revolution. The trio was enormously influential in popularizing ancient folk songs and vital new voices, Bob Dylan, Tom Paxton, Joni Mitchell, Gordon Lightfoot. Their own songs became hits the way tradition measures them. Noel Paul Stuckey's wedding song accompanies countless marriages, and Peter Yarrow's Light One Candle is a staple at family Hanukkah celebrations. The story actually begins with music manager Albert Grossman, who had an improbable idea. In 1961, campus hootenanny bands were all the rage, crew-cut kids singing bouncy folk songs. What if that was combined with the funky radicalism of Greenwich Village? He brought the idea to Peter Yarrow, who brought it to Mary Travers, known around the village for her bold contralto. Like Yarrow, she'd grown up in a leftist family, weaned on the folk songs of Pete Seeger. As a teenager, she'd sung with him on records. I had no desire to sing professionally, she recalled, but I had some need to say I existed. This sounded like a fun one-off project? Right. Next, they approached singer-comedian Noel Stuckey, who said no. Mary called to say she was coming over with a friend and hey, they could sing together. Oh, get it over with, Noel thought. Right. The instant their voices joined, they knew. All the voices were distinct, Peter said in the documentary Carry It On, and yet there was a sound between them. It was like falling in love. They revolutionized the ensemble norm of one lead singer backed by harmonies. To keep focus on the song, they switched melody parts, often in mid-verse. People never realized the leads were switching all the time, Mary wrote in her memoir, A Woman's Words. Our arrangements had much more texture than if we'd been a perfect trio. Grossman added marketing savvy, the cool collision of hipster goatees and Brooks Brothers suits, Mary's beatnik banged hair and elegant gowns. The name came from a folk lyric about Peter, Paul, and Moses. To make it work, Noel took the stage name Paul. Within seven months, they had a record deal. Their first single, Lemon Tree, was a top 10 hit. Their 1962 debut album hit number one, and in 1963, they had three albums in the top 10. One day beneath the lemon tree, my love and I did lie. Grossman had negotiated a unique contract, swapping the usual signing bonus for creative control. The trio was about to change everything, and nobody could stop them. If I had a hammer, I'd a hammer in the morning, I'd a hammer in the evening, all over this land. Their second single was If I Had a Hammer, written by Seeger and Lee Hayes, a radical plea for social justice, peace, and populism. As Richie Haven said, that song aided and abetted freedom to speak out. 
Top 40 Radio was playing protest songs, and a flood of left-leaning folk stars followed. It lifted Peter, Paul, and Mary to iconic status, igniting a torturous schedule of over 200 concerts a year, along with at least one album, and frequent appearances at rallies, protests, and marches. In 1963, they sang at the historic Civil Rights March on Washington. Mary remembered a black and white child playing together as she sang and thinking, this is the goal, the dream, calling it the most pivotal moment in her life. Peter said it changed the way the trio saw the world and their place in it. And oh, did they walk the walk, ignoring death threats to sing at the 1965 Selma March. Peter helped organize the 1967 anti-war march on the Pentagon. They sang for the United Farm Workers boycott, anti-nuclear protests, homeless shelters, toured Central America to protest U.S.-backed military atrocities, marched against apartheid, and wrote songs to empower the anti-bullying movement. Historian David Halberstam wrote, theirs is not just music that brings back memories of another time and place, but music as history itself. That crushing workload finally took its toll. It absolutely eviscerates your soul, Mary wrote. There's no time for love, for family, for relaxing. A brief hiatus lasted seven years. True to form, it was not money, but a needy anti-nuke rally that reunited them in 1978. They remained a semi-active group until Mary's death in 2009, hammering that hammer, ringing that bell, and singing about justice, freedom, and love between our brothers and our sisters. The miracle of Peter, Paul, and Mary is that even for a moment, such songs were heard all over this land. <laughs>